Welcome along, everybody, once again to episode two of Captain's Call. I am joined by the captain, Sergio Parise, Chris Robshaw, and journalist James Weil. This podcast is brought to you by eToro, the official investing and trading partner of Premiership Rugby. Tackle investing the smart way and join millions of UK investors on eToro today, the friendly platform for serious investors. eToro is a multi-asset investment platform. The value of your investments may go up or down. Your capital is at risk. Chris, sir, welcome along, former England captain. How have you been enjoying the pool stages, mate? Yeah, I've been um, I've been all right, thank you. Um, like a lot of English people back here, we've been not really sure what to expect going into it. We had that amazing win against Argentina. Our hopes completely skyrocketed. Um, and look, we haven't played brilliant rugby. We've won four out of four games. We're top of the pool. Now we're going into a quarterfinal. So, yes, things could be better, but we've done what we can. Sergio, sir, how about you? Obviously, Italy maybe well, didn't perform according to expectations, but how are you? How's the atmosphere in France? Yeah, definitely two tough weeks for from the Italian point of view, with two big losses against New Zealand and France. Um, well, the atmosphere in France is great. You know, French team is it's qualified. Uh, the news from Antoine Dupont are quite quite good, so probably it's, it's going to be back for the quarterfinals. So, you know, uh, all around France, they're really excited to this quarterfinal against South Africa. So, you're going to see a big game. Uh, James, I know you've been heading back and forth across the channel. Has it at least cooled down a bit after week one? The kind of intense heat that you're managing. Oh, uh, I think um, I think the first weekend in Paris. It was one of the hottest weekends I think I've experienced at the sporting ground. But um, it's interesting, Chris said about um, the mediocre interest over here. France, it's become rugby balmy. And everywhere you look, it's the World Cup. Everybody is celebrating. There's a real party atmosphere out there. It's been fantastic. Well, I can tell you here in New Zealand, like I feel like the interest has been a little bit muted as well, perhaps because we lost our first, you know, pool, ever pool game to France. But I did spot a Rugby World Cup jersey the other day. So at least maybe things as we warm up for the uh, the knockout stages are starting to get there. Now, before we get to the knockout stages, I just want to touch on the pool stages a little bit. Um, we're still, well, we're Scotland, Chris. Scotland had a tough pool, didn't they? Yeah, you know what? They, they did. They were up against two of the, the best sides in world rugby and both played different styles of rugby, but both very effective. Ireland, best I think I've ever seen them play. Um, they are formidable and South Africa know how to play knockout competitions. So they run you down and they're traditional. Um, and look, they did in the other games, but in all honesty, in those games, they didn't give a true effect. Of them say true of have seen when they play England and completed more recently. Um especially that island play. They were they were blown off the park. I think from their point of view and they came out what things and what to do. Uh, but they probably didn't follow enough to necessarily inside. And, uh, well, yeah, I guess that's, I mean, it's it's a tough one, isn't it, just with that pull. But I guess we knew that from the outset, basically, that someone was going to go home early. Um, Sergio, you touched on Italy. It's a pretty it's a pretty young side. What about, I mean, Kieran Crowley said this side next World Cup will be in a better place. Do you think he's right? Yes, when you see the, the age of the team, uh, second youngest team of the competition, um, they're going to arrive in the next World Cup. Most part of these players uh, around 27, 28 years old, around probably 50, 60 caps. Uh, though they're going to have another another amount of experience. So probably they're going to be a little bit more solid from from the experience point of view and as, as a team. And, and Gonzalo Quesada, new coach I, who I know very well, I think he's going to bring uh, some uh, new ideas and going to, you know, work very well in the next four years so definitely a really disappointing way to finish uh to tough defeat against new zealand and and france which is uh definitely not very good for for the italian rugby but 
in terms of looking looking forward for the future. Uh, you have a young team, so definitely they're gonna learn from from this World Cup. First World Cup for a, a lot of them. Uh, the captain, uh, most part of the player, they play their first World Cup. So you know, I'm, I'm really positive for the future. But at the present, really, really hard way to finish the World Cup. Yeah, I think it was the it was just the nature of those defeats, wasn't it? The scoreline. Yeah, exactly. You know, you, you, you can't expect to lose against New Zealand. Uh we must be honest. And France as well. We 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 had two big teams on the pool. Um, but the way that they lose and uh, the way that they don't compete at all. Uh if you see New Zealand game and France game, after twenty five minutes the the match was done. So uh, that's just really disappointed, uh, but it is what it is. Now is for this team the the World Cup is over, so they just need to yeah learn from the experience and and I really and I'm really sure with Gonzalo Quesada they're gonna you know uh, do some step forwards and hopefully in the next four years they're gonna you know achieve some good result and arrive in the next World Cup in Australia with some confidence and yeah with with more experience as well. I hope so, and I hope. Next World Cup, they don't get drawn in the same pool as New Zealand. Because... Every World Cup, Italy, New Zealand is like this. <laughs> Every World Cup. <laughs> yeah, we're getting sick of it. Uh, James, I know you've uh, spoken to Eddie Jones as your role as a in, in your role as a journalist before. How do you think Australia's gone? Oh, it's it's so difficult to to understand what's going on there. I mean, Eddie, at the best of times, um, is as is as mad as a box of frogs. Um, and I think I can understand why he wanted to go back to this basics approach of bringing the youth in a building for the future. Uh, equally, I think that the best way you embrace the rugby watching public is by getting results in the here and now. And I think to that extent, I have a view that he was frightened of using the old guard and failing. And I think if he went down the route of using the new guard, he'd always got the fallback excuse of saying, well, you know, I was trying something new. So I think there was a little bit of kidology going on there, but as usual, he's great value. Um, I think Australia have uh, given him a vote of confidence. So it looks like he'll be there uh, at least for the next year or so. Um, what I do worry about is that people in Australia, and I've spoken to a number of people, including David Campisi over there, uh, that people are talking about Eddie Jones rather than the Wallabies. And I just wonder um, how, in a very, very crowded marketplace in Australia, probably the most crowded winter sport marketplace, you know, with the, the draws of, of rugby league, uh, Aussie rules and so on and so forth. I just wonder how the Wallabies are going to survive and how they're going to attract talent when there's so many other distractions for them. I think it's a real uphill task for him. But at the end of the day, um, the good thing about Eddie is he's in his wheelhouse when he's got an Australian shirt on. So good luck to him. You know, I think the world of the bloke, uh, I know others don't, um, but I hope he succeeds. Yeah, he's certainly a, a divisive figure, <clears throat> to put it mildly, but I'm sure that nobody else has more of a passion for Australian rugby than, um, than well, Eddie Jones. Well, what I will say, Mark, uh, and I know Chris will back me up on this, if you want to talk to somebody about rugby, over a coffee or a glass of wine and just talk rubbish about rugby. Eddie Jones is pretty, he's great value. Okay, there you go, I'll bet. Um, now, Chris, I wanted to ask you a little bit about the bunker because that's been implemented at this World Cup. How have you, th have you kind of judged its, its impact on the game? Do you think it's good at kind of helping speed the game up? There's been a few kind of controversial calls. Yeah, I do. Um, I think with the bunker system, initially I thought it was a great concept because Myself and Sergio, we've been on the pitch and there's a TMO going on and it takes five, ten minutes, it takes the whole flow out of the game and it's been too long. However, I do think it's taken a little bit of responsibility away from the referees. That I think they have lost a bit of accountability there. So I think potentially we can almost meet somewhere in the middle and say, okay, they have three minutes or something to look at a decision. If it's not been made then, then maybe we go to the bunker and then we can look further at it. But I think it's too often the referee just takes the easy option now and says, look, the bunker, let's go away and deal with it. And then they can deal with it and it's out of their hands. Because look, if you're that person in the middle, you need to 
make the correct decision and you need to think about it and all that kind of stuff but it, it does need to be on them i think if they're in charge of the game you think there's a little bit of fear of the refs? Like, just they don't want to be the ones to make that, like, direct red card call. They don't want to be the ones to kind of ruin the game. They would rather just put it in somebody else's hands. Yeah, I do, because they're human. And we're all human. And um, referees, like players, have good and bad games. They might see things. They might not see things. and But they do their best out there, don't they, to, to referee. And they prepare as well. When they study the, the uh, people and the teams, they're going to be watching. Um but of course, it's that pressure affects them as well, potentially. Yeah, exactly. It's a, it's a tough job, and uh, I wouldn't want to do it. No, me neither. <laughs> <laughs> Sat here on the sidelines. Um, the last point about the pool stages is that I've had a little bit of feedback from some fans, Sergio, saying that yeah. there's too many kind of lopsided games. Like I had a look back at the 2019 World Cup, and I think only five times in the pool stages did a team get 50 points or more on their opposition. Yeah. But in this World Cup, you know, we've seen 90, 80, 70 kind of point score lines. Yeah. And some yeah. people tell me, you know, once it gets to 40 to nil, I'm just going to turn off and go to bed or watch something else. Do you think this is a problem for the World Cup? Is there anything like we can do about this? Well, definitely from the entire timing point of view, <laughs> it's not it's not very, very good to see a game. And after 25 minutes, you know, you see the game was done, 35, 45 points, and definitely some results was really tough, um, especially for some some the nation. Unfortunately, from the Italian point of view, was the last two two defeats, large defeat was was um, yeah, embarrassing for our rugby and and a little bit unacceptable as well. But um, if you see other nations like uh, Chile, uh, Uruguay, even Namibia, uh, in terms of how. Um, <clears throat> important is for those countries just to arrive in the World Cup because we must understand that for countries like Chile and Uruguay in South America, it's like people is talking about rugby in the country. So they they countries participating in a rugby World Cup, which is something great. Uh, from the other point of view, I can understand fans that, you know, they want to see big teams, big nations competing and say, what is the interest to see Chile taking 70 points from England? It's, uh, but from the other side, we must see how the impact that they have, the participation from Chile for the country, for the uh, for how you develop the rugby down there. And as we say plenty of time, uh, these, these teams especially arrive in the World Cup uh, without games of high level. Uh, you know, they have a domestic, for example, in South America, which is the first time in the Rugby World Cup you have three South American teams. Um, the domestic competition is something that they increase a lot of, uh, uh, increase the level of this, this team. But at the same time, for the, for example, team of North Hemisphere, they have no interest, you know, to play games, for example, against Chile, Uruguay, uh, or whatever. So uh, it's something that I think we're right. We must to think about it because this team needs to play more often against big teams. If it's not the, the, the first team, probably, I don't know, I spoke, before with some of, of you like playing like Ireland A or England A against Chile, Uruguay, still a big game, still a, a, be, a better level for those countries to improve. So, you know, there are different ways to try to help, but I can't understand from the fans' point of view, you want to see every every single game, you know, a close game. Uh, uh, the results really go something the L and some, some result was really, really large and definitely from the entertainment point of view was not really interesting. Well, James, didn't you say that Chile like had uh, front page news with the Rugby World Cup? Yeah, I mean, we um, the Chile England game, the Chile press were absolutely brilliant. And whilst the Chile national anthem was being played, I heard this noise behind me, and I looked round, and the guy who was the the top rugby journalist in Chile was crying his eyes out with his hand on his sleeve, just literally tears pouring down his face. And I thought, this is just absolutely incredible to watch somebody capture so much emotion. There was a Chilean traditional drumming band outside the stadium in Lille, and the whole place was just absolutely rocking. It was fantastic. But just going back on to this mismatch thing, I think we mustn't overlook the fact that we're in a stage in rugby, and it's a very unusual World Cup, that you've got four sides that are so far ahead of the rest of the pack you're going to see these mismatches 
um, you know, you've got the, the big four, Ireland, South Africa, New Zealand, France, and the difference between them and even Scotland in five, England in six or wherever is absolutely massive. So I think you've seen these, these mismatches polarised, not because of the poorness of the emerging nations, so I don't think they've been poor at all. I think even when Chile were thrashed by England, they stayed in the game, if that kind of makes sense. The difference between the emerging nations and and the top test nations is finishing in the red zone. It's as simple as that. If you watch Portugal, I was watching a bit of the Portugal game tonight. You know, they stayed with, with Fiji all the way down in the breakdown and so on and so forth. Um, and, you know, I put Fiji as, as being an elite side at the moment. That's that's just a personal view, especially as England might have to play them next weekend. But, but I think you have got this little anomaly. You've got these four absolute giants of rugby. Um, and I'm sure we'll talk about... The mismatch, the unfortunate draw, uh, a little bit later on. But I, I think with that, though, how how do we help these teams from a, a world rugby point of view? What are we doing? Do you? Because at the end of the day, like Sergio says, they need bigger games, they need bigger games, and more frequently, not just twice a year, three times a year. Um, do you even say in the groups now? So of course you go into a semi or quarter final. But then maybe the next two go into a plate or a shield and then the bottom one. So then on a Tuesday night, the plate game's being played. On a Wednesday night, the two Wednesday and Thursday, the two shield. And then you've got the, the proper comp in the quarterfinals towards the end. So then you're having rugby on TV more often. More people are seeing it. More people are getting games. Um, and yeah, like you said, trying to develop these sides more. And it'd be great for the Scots as well, that would, Chris. They could play in the shield. Well, exactly. I mean, there'll be some teams that don't like it. But Portugal have just scored against Fiji. Oh, my God. And so we are recording whilst the uh, Fiji-Portugal game is going on. Um, I'm not 100% sure how that, um, that England quarterfinal is going to pan out. But what we are sure of is that Wales is going to be taking on Argentina. Chris, like I mentioned in the last episode, has Ireland been flung under the radar? Well, nobody can say that anymore, but now Wales, are they a team which is slightly flying under the radar? Because despite their wins and they got, I think, uh, 19 out of 20 possible points, nobody's really bigging them up. You, you know what? I think they've got a little bit of belief now. Um, similar to England back here, there wasn't really many people giving Wales a, a chance to do well in this World Cup. They had that, that amazing game against Australia, their biggest victory ever. Uh, their captain, Jack Morgan, was absolutely superb, blood all over his face, a proper warrior. Um, some of their experienced players, Falata, bigger, of course, unfortunately, went up injured. Um, the likes of George North, Tompkins really stepped up. And their players have really gone about it and they've really grown every step of the way. Uh, and for me, I think they look really impressive. I think they've come a long way because even in that game you know, against Australia, their big kind of grudge game, they were a bit amanaring early on and then they just blew them away. Um, same with Fiji and then, of course, they played, they played Portugal, won pretty comfortably uh, and then Georgia as well. So I actually think going up against Argentina, I think they look favourites in that game. I think they've turned a the corner. Gatlin, whatever he does in camp and whatever magic he works and the players always speak about him and it's his mindset. It's not so much his training methods and his approach and tactics. It's And a lot of those good coaches at that level and international level are all about the mindset and getting players in the best possible shape, whether that be in the week, whether that be in the two minutes before the game, whatever it be, so that once they get there on a Saturday, they're ready to go. And he's definitely found that again. It, it's very interesting with the Argentina game coming up, Chris, because, and Sergio, you know, you know Argentinian rugby fairly well. I um, did a, a little uh, takes piece on the Argentinian game today, and I look forward to uh, the, the Wales fixture, and I thought there's a hell of a lot of symmetry about this game. They've both lost one of their best back row forwards. Um, Talupe, obviously, out with a broken arm, and it looks like Pablo Matera is out with a hammy. Yeah. Um, but if you then look at the superpowers of both teams, you have the aerial threat of the back three. That's certainly Argentina's superpower. You know, Buffelli, incredible, Malia. Uh, and they all play in that with that pacey, challenging side in the back three. And then you've got 
two back rows that will just go and kick lumps out of each other all day. You know, players like Marcus Cream are probably the biggest human being I think I've ever seen in my life. Um, but then you've got the people like Jack Morgan and so on and so forth that are very combative uh, players. So I think the Wales-Argentina game uh, is going to be a hell of a matchup because the sides are so evenly balanced. Sergio, what do you yeah, think? Yeah, definitely. Definitely. I agree with, with with Chris and you, James. Argentina started very badly, the, the World Cup. Um, the, the game against England was so poor from them, even if England, you know, play that game with a lot of hurt and and it was was what George Ford was fantastic that night. But in terms of how they show on the field, Argentina was wasn't wasn't great. Even if against against Samoa, uh, even this afternoon against Japan. So um, I'm, I really think that Wales built some confidence uh, in their game, much much confidence than Argentina. And but you know, Argentina is really tough. A team to play and you know from the emotional point of view they're gonna be you know on fire for the quarter final they have massive support a lot of a lot of argentinian uh, fans in france and um you know uh, it's gonna be hard and i think that the argies as every every single time is gonna be a, a difficult team to to win so as you say uh, i think i think argentina have probably um in this moment, not the best uh, shape in terms of their attacking, in terms of what they they show on the field, but in terms of playing this kind of game, in terms of the emotion, the character, and the determination they were going to have on the current final, I think they're going to be at a high level against Wales. So it's going to be a very interesting game to see. Now, speaking of fans, I mean, Sergio mentioned the Argentinian yeah, fans. Yeah. Chris, those Irish fans at this New Zealand Ireland quarterfinal, like that's going to be a home game for Ireland, more or less, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, we've we've seen the, uh, the Stade de France kind of rocking when when Ireland played South Africa there, and of course when they played Scotland, it's it actually looks quite of watching and playing a lot of rugby at that stadium. To see so much green there, it looks unusual. It looks a bit surreal, yeah. um, but, but it's brilliant, and that's what you want as, as spectators. And yeah. as English, we're not generally good at that about wearing the merchandise or our colours. People wear I don't know, a blue shirt or jumper or something. Whereas them, they all wear something Irish green, and it's so kind of recognisable. And yeah, look, they. As a team, they've been amazing, and it's a little bit closer to home than it is for the New Zealand fans coming over. Uh, but I'm sure they'll they'll have good support there. And the big thing now is the pressure on Ireland, and they keep talking about you're calling it private uh, pressure, we're calling it a privilege. Um, but New Zealand know how to be in these big games, and whether they've been at their best or not, they've scored a lot of tries. Have they been tested as much as they will against Ireland? No. Um, so I think that kind of swings it back to a bit more of an even playing field and out of all the teams I think Ireland could face and wouldn't want to face I think this would be the team they wouldn't want to face most I think you're right I think um, just going back to um, England fans not wearing too much kit Chris as it's come to my attention that the the, the majority of uh, English uh, male fans look something like Dan Cole um, uh, white is not a particularly flattering colour for people above eighteen stone. Um, but but I think you're absolutely, I think you're absolutely right about New Zealand because they score a lot of points. Um, the Irish defence is as tight as any in the game. And Sergio, you talk, you and I talked about the 150, yeah. 30 sides, the sides that have got that massive point difference with the brilliant defences. Um, and I think that New Zealand are the you know, if you go back to the Great All Black sides of 2015 and around that, they would habitually win against South Africa, England, Australia with 40 percent possession, because they were so efficient in the red zone. And when you look at the likes of Will Jordan, uh, the the X factor of Damien McKenzie, um, they've got so much firepower. And as um, I think. I, I certainly wrote about this. I think you and I talked about this on, on your podcast, Mark. When I watched New Zealand against France without um, Shannon Frizzell, 
without Geordie Barrett, they're incredibly lateral. They had nobody that had a big unit that could carry the ball up and really straighten their attack. Since Geordie Barrett and Cruzel have come back, they've started to score a lot of points. And I think it's that it's it's that contrast between the pace, the ingenuity, but also having somebody that can truck it up and really make the big dent in that uh, sort of first phase, second phase channel that, that will make the difference. I think I think also, sorry, from a from an Irish point of view though, their confidence will come from they've been to New Zealand and won a series down there which no I don't know any side that's done it or in significant time the Lions haven't even done it. A lot of their players, you look at the Sextons, Omanis, Connor Murray, these that are furlong, have beaten New Zealand four or five times, maybe even six times, which is unheard of. It's unheard of. They're probably even getting to that level where they may have even beaten New Zealand more than New Zealand have beaten them, uh, which is a big statement in itself. So there's a lot of confidence there side as well. Of course, being closer to home, playing playing pretty well. Um, yeah, they're going to be confident going into it. But it's, I mean, it's ahead of a quarter final, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, from a New Zealand point of view, certainly, you know, Ireland used to be a team that we never lost to, and now we lose to them with regularity. So it's, uh, it feels like a bit of a coin flip. Uh, maybe New Zealand go into that one as underdogs. I'm not sure. Can New Zealand break down that Irish defence is going to be a big, big question. Speaking of big questions, we're not quite sure as we sit here recording this who England is going to face in their quarterfinal because uh, Fiji ends are down against Portugal right now, Chris. Um, would you rather Fiji or would you rather Australia? Um, no, I, I think from a, a rugby point of view, taking my England hat off, I would love Fiji to, to be in that quarterfinal. Uh, I think what it brings to the sport is it's better to have different teams get through there and they'll definitely become everyone's favourite team which aren't in the quarterfinal. And everyone around the world will be supporting them. From a threat to England, I think Australia will probably be a bigger threat with, with Eddie there, um, with their players. I think with the Fijian sides, even though they did beat this England side in a warm-up game, uh, I think the games, the tournaments will start to take a little bit of fatigue out of them. Their squad probably isn't as deep and rich as a lot of other squads. Of course, they have a huge amount of talent, a huge amount of individual flair, um, and we've seen the levels they produce. Can they continue to do that would be the big question I'd ask. So from an England point of view, I would hope um, if it's either of those sides, they'd be pretty confident. Yeah, I think they've probably surprised a lot of people with how they've gone about this campaign, haven't they? Their defence has been incredible. I mean, they've only conceded, I think, one try against Argentina. They didn't concede any tries against uh, Japan or Chile. And then they were pushed a little bit by Samoa in that last game, though. Yes, uh, that, that was a, um, a little bit too tight, I think. Um, my, my old mate, Danny Kerr, was... Not known for his defensive tackling, but he, I mean, the tackle he produced basically kept England out of a lot of embarrassment from their point of view to lose that way, um, but also to not lose to another another side as well to build that confidence and, yeah, basically move forward. It wasn't pretty, but they got themselves out of trouble and I think they'll be glad that game's over. I think they'll be looking and thinking. And also, you look at the TMO decision. In the rules of the game, if a, a ball is kicked for a conversion, you can't go back. Ah, you can now. They changed it to the tournament, Chris. Oh, they did that? Okay. Okay. Yeah, well, that's yeah. my mistake. That's what you yeah. said. So they did this in order to try and speed the game up so they could review during the conversion. My, my mistake, but that was, yeah, I mean, that was a big, a big let off for him at that. Yeah. Even the yellow card, the yellow card that someone take from the high tackle was like a little bit, you know, just was a high tackle, but was not danger or nothing. And just a yellow card there was a really tough for them. But I think for England, it was just important to win that game. And uh, yes, disappointed for, from the Samoan team because they, they play they play a great game that night. But, you know, at the end of the day, as you say, from the England point of view, just another win and and just build that confidence for the current final. 
have you made of um sorry i was going to talk about fiji just for a second because fiji this world cup hasn't been necessarily just seven style flare offloads lots of tries it's been like great set piece great work at the breakdown yeah they look much better much well organized you know if um i know simon raul louis uh very well because he he was in paris in 2015 uh, with south francais so i know he's, he's a really really intelligent guy really intelligent guy and he when you say we see uh we everyone talk about their their backs they they you know the powerful uh they speed uh, their skills, but you see the set piece. They have solid scrum now. They still having some, you know, good liners as well. And then the number nine have good kicking game as well. So actually, they, they they're well organized. And uh, you know, it's I think it's that the reason because today they are really competing and you know they have a chance to play in the quarter final. As long as Portugal. Doesn't. As long as Portugal, yeah. <laughs> They've only got to get one point, haven't they? So if they finish within, uh, was it seven points, eight points, then they're through. Um, yeah, yeah, exactly. Well, um, that's definitely the their biggest work, isn't it? It's a, it's a set piece. It's a, the non-glamorous stuff. I think they've made massive strides in. Yeah, the yeah. scrum, the line out, the kicking games, uh, yeah. the areas of games where people used to target them and say, you know what, if we are playing against a PG. We keep, especially from an England point of view, we'd say yeah. we don't want to get into a, a throwing the ball around a loose game because they are so much better than us at that. Yeah. So what do we want to do? We want to kick the ball high. We want to compete. We want to put it in the corner. We want to scrum. Whereas now, if they take that away from you, yeah. and you have to yeah. get into from those throwing the ball around there, it's, it's very very tough. Yeah. Is that because a lot of you know people like Ronnie Maui's playing at Saracens? You've got uh, Lavani playing at uh, La Rochelle. You know they're bringing the good practice of, of, of European champions back into the Fijian side, and Ralini also as a former Saracen, um, Savarese himself. You know there's a lot of experience coming back. Would, would that be uh, one of the reasons they're uh, starting to gel in that, in those respects? Yeah, yeah, definitely. I think also their Super Rugby side as well. Yeah, a lot of them are playing together more frequently, and and they've had some big scouts. They've won a, a lot of a lot of a big big games in Super Rugby. Yes, we we know a lot of the superstars over here in Europe, and a lot of them will be whether that be marquee signings or from the big players, the big go to backs. But a lot of the the hard working forwards and, and really kind of earn their trade now. How good would it be just if, if Australia did get through? I know it's still, as we watch the game, it's not much of a chance, but just the Eddie Jones to face England thing, would be, wouldn't that be a bit extra spicy, Chris? Yeah. There was definitely a lot of that when he left. Um, and with Eddie, when, especially when he was coaching England, and he, he's been around, he's worked with a lot, he's worked with obviously Australia, South Africa, he knows the Kiwis well, he's worked in Japan, a lot of club games. And he'd always speak about players' mindsets and what certain people are like. And you know that he would be in that Australian change room saying, I don't know, Fowles this, Ford's this, Ellis Genji's this. Do you know what I mean? And just kind of trying to wind him up like he used to try and wind us up in preparation. He'll be, uh, he'll be talking about his cross models again, Chris. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure. <laughs> Yeah, the last one is France taking on South Africa. That's another clash of the Titans, Sir Joe. How do you think yeah. this big clash between these two giant packs is going to go? Well, look, obviously, no big game uh, for sure. Um, you know, uh, I think uh, France is is waiting for Dupont a lot, but Maxime Lucou do a great a great game against Italy. Was you know was I think uh, very well organized and. Uh, you know, of course, France have you know uh, a lot of the, the, the support of the the, the fans. They're gonna play inside the France. The vibe is gonna be amazing, and uh, uh, it's gonna be interesting to see how they're gonna play against against South Africa. Um, and if it's the pawn, uh, is the pawn is gonna play or not? That is changed a lot in especially in their head as well, and for the uh, opponent as well. You know, and um, yeah, it's gonna to be tough. Uh, I think France is gonna win. Um, honestly, I think they 
they are in a good in a good moment and uh, I don't see France losing that game against South Africa even if of course of course South Africa <laughs> have obviously the you know everything to win that game but uh, I'm, I'm I'm see France too solid in this moment um and I've seen Jolly Bird and all the the France backs uh playing with a lot of uh, confidence and um and from the defensive point of view, honestly, South Africa is so sometimes struggling a little bit uh, in terms of, uh, you know, even against Scotland, first game against Scotland. Uh, Scotland have so many opportunities to score and uh, they really they really look a little bit, you know, struggling, in, especially from the first two, two, three phases from scrum and lineups. I saw the, 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 the South African defense a little bit struggling, but then, you know, it's a really solid game. Probably going to see it again a 7-1 bench on 8-1. <laughs> 8-0 bench against France, but you know, I think France is going to win that game. Sergio, how um, what was it like in France when Dupont got injured? Because just in England, seeing it on social media, seeing everything, it was it was like someone in our royal family had died or, or something like that. Yeah, <laughs> definitely. It was exactly that. It was was everyone? Everyone was like someone died. It was terrible, and it was a lot of pressure as well to. Uh, Fabien Galtier, because if you remember, like he uh, taken a shot in what well, the game against Namibia was like 51-0 at the end of the first half, and everyone say why Dupont still still on the pitch, and uh, so a lot of questioning around Galtier and around why you you know uh, you know left Dupont on on, on that game, and at the same time. Um, you know, uh, he had the surgery really, really soon, and the French communication as well. Uh, they communicate every time, say uh, Dupont is gonna be back. Uh, probably is gonna be a little bit, you know, uh, early for the Italian game, but he's gonna be there for the current final. So actually, they trying to, you know, say to the people he's gonna be there. So we're gonna see. I think he had a uh, tomorrow and uh, Monday they have a, a meeting with his. Um, Doctor to see your yeah, surgeon to see if you have the green light because he had the concussion as well. So the concussion protocol was all right. Now he's fine. So you know, uh, I'm truly really think that he gonna he gonna play that game. And the fact is gonna see if, if he can play, you know, um, at his level uh, because you know cheekbone is like it's, it's not nothing. It's, and and I see South Africa is gonna try to target him and trying to put him, you know, under pressure. So we're gonna see. Do you think there's a chance that they might just keep Luca as the starter? Because I do. Look, honestly, uh, there's no way. You think they'll throw it all in? No way. No way that no way just for one reason, because I know Galtier. And what's happened if you if you don't force the pawn just for you know giving him an extra week for the semi final and you lost against South Africa? Yeah. Because uh, honestly, and I'm I'm really you know disappointed to say that, but they play against Italy, which was not Italy in the best <laughs> in the best day. But definitely, uh, South Africa is another challenge. And Luku uh, is is obviously a good number nine, but it's no it's no a ton of point. You know what I mean? And uh, uh, Dupont is a guy who can really really make the difference. He's a guy who. You know, take the attention, especially in that in from the defense point of view for South Africa. If you have a guy like Antoine Dupont running around the rocks, it's gonna cause some problems. And I don't think that Galtier is gonna risk to say, okay, we go with the coup and see what happens, and you know, uh, give an extra an, an extra week to to him. So I think if Dupont is okay, he's gonna play. I think one of the things that I've I've uh, I think have made France in this tournament. Um, when Roman and Tamak uh, got injured, I think uh, a lot of people said, oh, well, it's the end of France's tournament. And I, I wrote on several occasions, well, um, as far as I'm concerned, Matthew Jalibert is equally as good, if not better, than Roman and Tamak. He, you know, this guy is absolutely world-class. He's also an 80-minute fly half, whereas I felt at times when Tamak drifted in and out of games. Whereas uh, with Jalibert, you really got 80-minute performances. And I think in this tournament, he has just come out of, uh, any shadow of, of doubt that anybody in France had. He's just lit the tournament up. And against, um, uh, in the last game uh, on Thursday night, seven try assists and a try for himself. 
And in the cycle between World Cups since 2019 to now, he now has more try assists, more tries and more points than any other fly half in the world. Quite a remarkable record. Yeah. I mean, you've played against Sergio. What's he like? Yeah. You know, it's like before the before the World Cup, um, especially when Roman Tamang got his first choice in number 10, he was like, okay, I'm the number 10. He can, you know, go in probably in the second half, put some mixed factor, and trying to, you know, some the difference, and especially individually because he's, he's a really good player, but he he sometimes he really likes to attack the line. Uh, B, it's different than Tamak. And Tamak play more. Uh, it's a team player, you know. Uh, yeah, he's a more a playmaker. He he gonna go probably two or three times in a game, but he gonna you gonna target very well when you see some mismatches in front of him. And Jolly Bear is more. Uh, you know, intuitively going to try to go, try to change the direction, see w how many times he, you know, from Brax, he changed the direction and trying to attack him because he's really, really fast. He's trying every time to, you know, uh, you know, make that late pass until the end because trying to force the pass until the end. And it's a really good attacking play. But in a career final with uh, more press, much pressure, pressure on him, probably a close game. Uh, it's going to be interesting how you see how he managed the game because his kicking game is good, but it's not as good as probably uh, Tamak and probably especially Dupont because Dupont have a really good kicking game as well, and uh, yeah. he take he take the responsibility as well from the kicking game more than than uh, than Luku did in the last game. So definitely great great player, but it's important to see him really really under pressure um, against South Africa. Now, Chris, speaking of players, world-class players coming back from injury, the Springboks, with the injury to Mapimpi, were able to bring back in Lucanio up, one of the best midfielders in the world. Can you see them chucking him straight into the starting lineup? Yeah, I, I do. I mean, I think with, with players of that quality, it's, I think a lot of coaches go back to what they know. When, when people always say, oh, they haven't played it well, and then with a coach, it is on you. It's on you, whether it's right or wrong, and whether you win or lose, whatever it be, you know, and you have to be confident in your selection. That's why often people say, well, this player is playing better in the league, but a coach will probably pick who they know and who they trust. And if we're big knockout games, he'll know he's delivered in big finals before, semi finals, quarterfinals, all that kind of stuff. Because it is different when you get to knock out rugby, whether that be in a club competition to an international competition. Um, and you go to people a lot of the time who have been there and done it, and, and he definitely is one of them. Last question before we wrap things up. James, has your favourite now changed as we know the teams lining up for the final, or the quarterfinals? Uh, I think it's France for me. It's just the romanticism. Um, I think they've got a number of selection calls to make. Sergio and I were talking yesterday about whether or not they go for Jolange coming back um, on the uh, left flank or whether or not they go for Francois Cross uh, uh, against South Africa. I think, Sergio, we both agree they'll probably go with Francois for his accuracy in and around the ruck. Um, yeah. And Jolange is probably the better impact player of the two in any case. Um, I think, and I think it'll also be interesting to see who they pick on the left wing, if they go for Barbieri or if they go for Gavin Villiers. I would certainly, after what I've seen from Barbieri, uh, I, I couldn't leave that guy out of any rugby team that I picked. Um, if if I had one doubt about France, it would be that I think they're one big forward away from where they would need to be against the Springbok side. Um, and I'm thinking, you know, in, in in the second row and so on, Paul Williams is a big loss. Uh, and I just wonder if they can maintain the sheer physicality for 80 minutes that they'll need against the box. That's my only drawback. Yeah, I think there are probably some some tough call to make to France. As you say, I think uh, Louis Bielberet, the winger, was outstanding in the last two games. But he's 20 years old and, and Gabin Villiers, which is was my teammate last week, uh, last year, sorry, uh, is really solid. Um, he's a tackler, Jacqueline. Uh, in a close game, uh, probably against South Africa, 
I don't think I don't know if Galtier is gonna leave him out. And about Cross, yeah, I'm really with you. I think Antoine Antoine Jolange need to have some game time, and and that was the reason, obviously, because he he played probably against Italy. But uh, um, in from the physical point of view, it's gonna be interesting to see. Gonna keep Woki and Flamandi the second in the locks. Sorry, and they're gonna bring uh, Romanta for Finua, who is in the bench. It's uh, uh, you know, he gives some some physicality. Is your favorite now still France? Yeah, uh, France for me for me is definitely favorite to win the World Cup. Okay, and Chris for you, last one. Did I say France initially? Did you say France? I think so. I, I think I did. I think I did. I actually think Ireland now. I've I've actually changed in the last their game against South Africa and their game against obviously Scotland. The, the bits in between have been. They also, I don't think, off the top of my head, haven't have got any injuries from or to their key players anyway, which. Which always makes a, a big difference. And you look at some of the other sides are starting to pick up one or two. Yes, we spoke about Dupont coming back, but there's South Africa have lost, of course, a mark, a big hooker. England have lost someone now. Um, teams are starting to pick up injuries. And that was always going to be the case. And I think if you can get your squad fit, um, so I've, Ireland do. I think grown even more in this tournament and really embraced the occasion. Uh, what their method is behind that, I'm not sure. Uh, but Andy Fowl, you look at his experience, you look at the coaching group as well. The players seem really confident and happy. And I mean, for for someone like James Lowe's tackle on on Exeter in that in that Southampton clash, a big six foot seven, whatever he is, and force of running out winger, and he's picked him up and driven him back, and that was. A huge moment in that game, um, but for me, they they've been the side which hasn't been caught or hasn't had to have a difficulty finding a way out of anything yet. They seem to have kind of gone through pretty smoothly. Even France, you look at their second game with Uruguay, they they weren't particularly pretty or good at that, but they got themselves out of trouble. Whereas I think this Irish side have, have come through pretty smooth. Yeah. As a New Zealand fan, uh, if Ireland or France were to win it, I don't think we would be too sad. It'd be nice to see a new team uh, lifting yeah. the Webb Ellis Trophy, I think. But yes, mm. that's it, folks. Um, this podcast was brought to you by eToro, the official investing and trading partner of Premiership Rugby, tackling investing the smart way with uh, joining millions of um, UK investors on eToro today. The platform for serious investors. eToro is a multi asset investment platform. The value of your investments may go up or down. Your capital is at risk. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, Sergio. Thank you, James. We'll see you again for the final episode just before the Rugby World Cup final. See you later, guys. Cheers, boys. See you soon. Bye.